Hello everyone and welcome to Lesson 13.1a. I've entitled this video, The Oregon Country. This video is going to cover pages 348 to 351. Rivalry in the Northwest. The Oregon Country was a huge area located north of California between the Pacific Ocean and the Rocky Mountains. It included all of what are now Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, plus parts of Montana and Wyoming. The region also contained about half of what is now the Canadian province of British Columbia. And you can see that pictured here on what back then was called Oregon country. Question number one, what area was considered the Oregon country back in that time? And you can see it's basically the area north of California between the Pacific Ocean and the Rocky Mountains. And it included back then of what we now call Oregon, Washington, Idaho, plus parts of Montana, Wyoming, and the British uh, Columbia province of Canada. In the early 1800s, four nations, as well as numerous Native American nations, claimed the vast rugged land known as the Oregon Country. The United States based its claim on Robert Gray's discovery of the Columbia River in 1792 and the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Great Britain had explored the Columbia River. Spain controlled California and Russia had settlements south from Alaska into Oregon. Question number two, what five groups claimed the land in the Oregon Country? Well, you had four countries and then the Native Americans. So let's start with Native Americans who were already there, living there. So let's not forget them, let's put them first. But then the other four countries that were claiming this lands were the United States, Russia, Spain, and Great Britain. Adams Onus Treaty. Many Americans wanted control of Oregon in order to gain access to the Pacific Ocean. In 1819, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams got Spain to approve the adams onis Treaty. The Spanish agreed to set the limits of their territory at what is now California's northern border, and to give up all claims to Oregon. In 1824, Russia also gave up its claim to the land south of Alaska. Dealing with Great Britain was more complicated. In 1818, Adams worked out an agreement with Britain for joint occupation. This meant that people from both the United States and Great Britain could settle there. When Adams became president in 1825, he proposed that the two nations divide Oregon along the 49 degree north line of latitude. Britain refused, and the countries extended the joint occupation. Question number three, what was the big reason why Americans wanted control of the Oregon country? They wanted access to the Pacific Ocean. We already had access to the Atlantic Ocean. If we had access to the Pacific Ocean, we would then become uh, able to trade with both parts of the world, both the Atlantic Ocean side and the Pacific Ocean side. So that was a big deal, was the trading using the Pacific Ocean's access. Question four, how did the adams onis Treaty help America's claims to the Oregon country? Well, we agreed with, with Spain that they would no longer have the control of the lands north of the 42 degree line of latitude there. So we basically said, okay, this will be us. And then later on, Russia got rid of their claims, so then it just came down to us and Great Britain. Which leads us to question five. How did joint occupation work with the British in the Oregon country? We agreed that we would share the land there, that both Great Britain and the United States could both settle there at the same time. Mountain men in Oregon. Fur traders had been the first people from the United States to take up the challenge of living in the Oregon country. They came to trap beaver, whose skins were in great demand in Europe. The British established trading posts in the region, as did merchant, pictured here, John Jacob Astor of New York. In 1808, Astor organized the American Fur Company, the country's leading fur com company. It traded on the East Coast, in the Pacific Northwest, and in China. Question number six. What was the big economic reason to go to Oregon country early on in its history? the trading of furs, and specifically at that time, the trading of beaver furs, as back then, these beaver hats were very fashionable at that time, and so that was a big industry. And question seven, why does John Jacob Astor make the history books? Because he was the leading fur trader at that time. In fact, as you can see here from the bullet points, he was the first multimillionaire in American history. And at the time of his death, he was the wealthiest person in the United States. Uh, today, his estimated value would be $138 billion. 
Uh, he is considered to be the third wealthiest American in our history after only John D. Rockefeller and Cornelius Vanderbilt. So he made his wealth mainly in the fur industry at that time. At first, the fur merchants traded with the Native Americans. Gradually, others joined the trade. These tough, independent men spent most of their time in the Rocky Mountains and were known as mountain men. And we can see two different pictures here of mountain men. Many had Native American wives. They lived in buffalo skin lodges and dressed in fringed buckskin pants, moccasins, and beads. Over time, the mountain men could no longer make a living by trapping. Overtrapping limited the amount of pelts available and changes in fashion reduced demand for pelts. Some moved to Oregon and settled on farms. With their knowledge of the western lands, several mountain men, such as Jim Bridger and Kit Carson, found work as guides. They led the parties of settlers now streaming west. Beginning in the 1830s, the mountain men carved out several east to west passages that played a vital role in western settlement. The most popular route was the Oregon Trail. Others included the California Trail and the Santa Fe Trail. Question number eight, who were the mountain men? These were, as the book says, the tough, independent men who spent their time in the West there, the Rocky Mountains. They were, uh, many had Native American wives. They dressed, as you can see in the pictures here, in buffalo skin, buckskin pants, moccasins, and beads. And their original uh, standard of living was to basically trap uh, for, fee uh, for beaver furs and other furs. That's how they made their money at the start. Then, as the demand for beaver furs and other furs changed, some of them had to actually switch to going to farming and others actually switched to becoming trail guides and things like that. And that leads us to question nine. What factors forced the mountain men to change how they made their living? Changes in fashion and over trapping. It was just harder to find some of these uh, animals as uh, too many people had been killing them. And so their numbers were not able to replenish. Oregon and Manifest Destiny. In the 1830s, Americans began traveling to the Oregon country to settle. Economic troubles in the East and reports of Oregon's fertile land drew many people. Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. Among the first settlers were Dr. Marcus Whitman and his wife Narcissa, pictured here at the bottom left. They were missionaries who went to Oregon in 1836 and built a mission among the Cayuse people near the present site of Walla Walla, Washington. That is a fun one to say. They wanted to provide medical care and convert the Cayuse to Christianity. The new settlers unknowingly brought measles to the mission. Native Americans had never been exposed to this disease. An epidemic killed many of the Cayuse children. The Cayuse blamed the Whitmans. They attacked the mission in November of 1847 and killed the Whitmans and 11 others. And that is leading us to question number... 10. What factors led to American settlers wanting to move to the Oregon country in the 1830s? Well, two, one was a push factor and one was a pull factor. A push factor is what pushes you something out of somewhere and a pull factor is what draws you there. Well, the push factor was on the East Coast where the economic panic of 1837 led people to think about moving out to the West. The pull factor was that Oregon was known to have this fertile land great for farming and so that is what drew people to Oregon as well. Question 11. Why did the Whitmans travel to Oregon country in 1836? They wanted to set up a missionary, a, a mission, and they were missionaries, and they wanted to convert the Cayuse people there to the religion of Christianity. Question 12. Why did the Cayuse kill the Whitmans? Well, sadly, the Native Americans did not have the diseases, uh, resistances to measles, and when the Whitmans brought it accidentally, many of these Native American Cayuse were exposed they died, and the Cayuse, of course, blamed the Whitmans, and so they took it out on them, and they did kill them and 11 others. Along the Oregon Trail The Whitman Massacre was a shocking event, but it did little to stop the flood of pioneers on their way to Oregon, as you can see pictured here. Drawn by reports of fertile Oregon land and driven by economic hard times in the East, many Americans took to the trail. These pioneers were called emigrants, people who leave their country because they left the United States to go to Oregon. Question 13, what are immigrants? Immigrants are people who leave their country. In 1843, about a thousand emigrants made the journey. 
Tens of thousands more would follow in the years ahead. Before the difficult 2,000-mile journey, these pioneers packed all their belongings. They stuffed their canvas-covered wagons with supplies. From a distance, these wagons looked like schooners or ships at sea, and people called them prairie schooners. And you can see one diagrammed on the right. Gathering in Independence, Missouri, or other towns in Missouri, the pioneers followed the Oregon Trail across the Great Plains, along the Platte River, and through the South Pass to, of the Rocky Mountains. Then they turned north and west along the Snake and Columbia Rivers into the Oregon country. And you can see that route right here, starting in Independence, Missouri, and following along, crossing many rivers, as you would know if you played the game Oregon Trail, as I did when I was much younger. And here is, oh wait, let's go back to some questions first. I almost got ahead of myself there. Question 14, how long was the journey to the Oregon country? It was a 2,000 mile journey. Question 15, what was a prairie schooner? That was the wagon that hauled all the supplies and the people going to Oregon. And question 16, what city in Missouri was a popular launching point for those braving the Oregon Trail? The city of Independence, Missouri. And before we go, I wanted to show you here are just a couple of uh, listings of some of the items they would have taken and how much things cost back then. 400 pounds of bacon for $40. That would be a steal today. Also sounds delicious. And here is another listing of some of the sundries and camp needs that you would need on the trip to have to make sure the trip went successfully. Well, thank you for watching. Before we go, I have not one, but two things for you. Oregon Trail, killing third graders with dysentery since 1983. Oh yes, I definitely played that game uh, a long time ago. And then ways I spent my time while playing Oregon Trail in elementary school. And then you see a pie graph breaking that down. <laughs> well, thank you so much for watching and have a great day.